Well, fellas, here we are. My largest buck to date, an awesome hunt, and this is a perfect example of how making a move and not being afraid to do something that's a little bit take you out of your comfort zone can reap major rewards, and uh, it's an awesome hunt. Casey, I, that was a fantastic hunt. I mean, the execution, everything, I, it was fantastic to be able to come together, but I know that there's a deeper story behind the movement of this blind because we had done extensive work in creating bedding thickets, doing some TSI in and around a previous set, but you guys went ahead and went super aggressive and made a tough call to move a blind, but kind of walk us through like pre and post experiences with this whole kind of setup. Well, what makes it more difficult is, was it two years, Casey, prior to this? Two years we shot um, wide load. It was two years out of the set that we moved. Mm -hmm. And so we had uh, three years of ob observation out of the set before we moved it. And we kept saying every single time we would go in there, we liked it. Yeah. Um, and, it and it produced, I mean, it produced a Boone and Crockett whitetail with a bow. Um, but we're like, you know what? It just never felt right on our exit and entry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we had all the TSI work. We had the food. We had the water. Everything was already there. But every time we walk in and out of there, we're like, we are our worst enemy. But we couldn't quite figure out w what's the next move. And after seeing it for three years of deer traffic, mm -hmm. we were sitting there going, it became really quite simple. It wasn't really like it was a mon monumental decision. It wasn't because right. we, we had three years of, of uh, watching deer tr traffic uh, moving on the east side, and we're like, that's it. And we walked over there that fall, and we found the tree, and we are like, we can always go back. Yeah, right, for sure. Rich is pull the trigger, make the move. We knew how good it was, but we truly thought with this one, we'd have a better wind direction, better entry and exit, and it's the first hunt of the year. Yeah, I mean, the final straw, we were actually hunting where Greg harvested Big Barrel, which is – you know, to the west a ways of where I ended up harvesting this year, the previous year, and had Pinch Hitter, the buck that I ended up, mm -hmm. was able to harvest, come out basically of where we ended up moving to. So we're in okay. there hunting does, and Greg and I have been discussing this move all year. Like, you know, hey, should we, should we not? What are we, what are we gaining? Writing down the pros and cons, like yeah. what's the benefits of it? And then seeing him come out of there was kind of like, for me, I was like, we have to try it. Yeah. And like Greg said, if it's not good, it doesn't work out for us, something happens where we don't like it. But we had a pretty good idea. I mean, we were gaining three different wind directions by making the move. And reducing a lot of the um, entry exit. That, that, that route became really superb on how to be able to access that blind. So, Adam, are you able to show us here on the map where that previous blind was and then kind of where it got moved to and what those entry exits we're able to you know, kind of change and gain for this setup because to me that's just the the whole story of the hunt is still being a student of those observations watching how deer reacted to these bedding cuts where the food was um and then just realizing gosh we can make this thing just a little bit better adam yeah. with with onyx can you can you do the uh the line distance and go from where the, the blind yeah. was to where it is tell me how far that is it's already 180 yards 180 yards so well more at, than less than half. Mm -hmm. A better spot, better exit and entry, and you can actually see quite well there. And that was my biggest fear of uh, we did lose some because we don't have that long um, field to the northwest, that long shoot. Sure. Um, yeah. But um, you're not going to have everything stack up in your favor. So well, I think to, I think to, to most people too. I, I think a lot of people put a ton of value on views like long distance, they want to be able to see what's happening. But when you compare that entry and exit and you're way less than half of the foot traffic and, and where you're actually walking and where other deer are moving to that crossing your path, you gained so much, even though you lost some visibility, you're hunting mo mainly with a bow. Anyhow, you might've been able to decoy or call to a deer at the far end of that field, but the value of decreasing how, how many steps it takes you to get to that blind and the wind gain, wow. To, uh, to me, this is the exact, the, the enemy of great is good, and you guys had a good setup, but you didn't have a great setup. And a lot of times, 
people will not make the tweaks because they feel like they're in a good spot when you can move it 30 yards, 50 yards, or 100 yards and be like, now I'm in a great spot. My access is way better. The setup is way better. Like I can, I can hunt on four different winds versus one, and that one's just mediocre at best. Right. Like this is – I mean, we were in them. Day yeah. one. Yeah. I, I mean, we should exe- we could have could have executed it the very first set. And that's a great point. You know, we were able to hunt this deer multiple days purely back because of the change. Yes. Yeah. With the way it set up, we probably – so you needed something east to hunt the prior stand, mm-hmm. preferably northeast. But that deer that night kind of came from the south. Yeah. So anything out of the north, we have problems with them, you know, and – it ended up that he worked in from a direction that we didn't predict. And all year, the reveal pictures were getting him coming out of the bedding thickets from the northeast. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that TSI up there, he was utilizing those walking the food plot out into the grain field. So I think, you know, uh, having intel is one thing, right? And Casey touched on it that he was coming from the northeast based mm-hmm. on a re- our reveal trail camera picks. The reason why we were successful is because of the move, but because of the added wind directions we gained, us not knowing he was going to come from the west in the southwest, if that was the case and we were back in set, the original set, we would have blew him out on the way in. Sure. Mm-hmm. No question. Yeah. So that's the whole thing about make the move. If you have enough intel, build your confidence, make the move, and here we are, day one. And the fact that it didn't pan out on day one our exit and entry allowed us to hunt them the next day because of the move. If yes. that if we wouldn't have moved it, we wouldn't be able to get out of there. We would have blown them out of the county. Yeah, and I think he really showed his, you know, that he wasn't as pressured as you and I were concerned that he might be. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were worried that well, almost to the point where we didn't go back in there. Yeah, yeah. and and obviously he walks out in broad daylight broad. to say, didn't you know, care. so he really didn't have too much of an idea what happened after the first hunt. Mm-hmm. Clearly, because he, you know, he showed up in broad daylight, and in but if we're on that other side, we don't, we don't have a chance day two. And that's Agreed. that's what I really like about the setup here is not only does this perform really well early season because you have that green to grain transfer, you've got multiple food sources, but you you look at this set on Onyx and where those bedding thickets are. If you're drawing a kind of a line of of ridge top, and most of those bedding thickets are on points, right? Because that's very advantageous for deer to bed on. Now we're putting the, the right cover and structure on there too. So they're going to do it more consistently. But when a deer or, or, or a buck specifically is checking those bedding areas, he's essentially going to be walking right out in front of this blind now down this ridge with the right wind that's, that you can access but be sent checking the bedding thickets that are to the north. But then the bedding thickets that are across the field where the blind was originally at, he can just loop right around there and then go and check those as well. So just that exchange, no matter really what time of the year that you want to hunt that blind on, it's still very functional for early season, mid season. You leave standing grain there, late season you can hunt it, and you just have this mm-hmm. it's just matching topography, habitat, and hunting strategy. And this is like a dream setup. And this is one thing with Casey and I do extremely well all fall long, which is we may not harvest something on our sits. But what we, we do do is harvest information. Mm-hmm. And so when we go in there, we're constantly talking back and forth of what we can learn, how do we make things better. Right. And I think you start stacking this stuff up and you write notes and you revisit them, it becomes a repetitive thing over time. And that's one thing that I would suggest all of our viewers to do is if you sit, sit with a purpose. Yeah. Even if you don't harvest, harvest information and make notes and then move on those action points. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, when if you take away all those points, the additions of, of habitat um, features here that, that have been added over the past couple of years, um, it's still a good spot. Mm-hmm. But but you take those attributes of the topography, um, where how you can manipulate food, how you can manipulate the bedding, and it just again goes farther into the, making a good spot. Great. And well, you know, Onyx Hunt is a great example. You and I would sit at the table for hours trying to spell this out using all the tools without having to penetrate in there and spelling it all out right in front of us, and then that's how we made the move. Yeah, and this, I probably say this about every location that we have success at, but it's one of my favorites. We call it pond pinch for a reason. There's a pond that forms a pinch on the top of the hill, but if a deer 
pops out in the green, mm-hmm. a deer that is your target deer, he is in big trouble. As long as you, because there's just no room once he reads the script. Once he commits. He has to commit it to come out in front of the blind. Yeah. If he comes from the opposite direction and is moving in your direction, he's still in big trouble. The way that is is pinched down right there, you're just in him from both ways. It's it's very good for us and very bad for them. Yeah. And it just works great. And those are the places on a farm, and I feel like every farm has some of those areas that sometimes they're often overlooked or they're not, if you will, exploited to the degree that they can be. Maximized. Yeah, like where can where can you continue to add features and different function to that area that just makes them do it 10 times more? And when they do that, it's like, well, they're consistently here. They're scraping on these lower limbs. If they come out, they're probably going to commit and walk through. I, it just increases shot opportunities tenfold. Casey, you said something I want to I want to touch on because I think this was uh, an an idea that got misinterpreted for years. When you say that it's all it's great and you're it's like really good for you, but not great for them. And I think a lot of times when we set up stands, and it's like, oh, okay, the wind is perfect for me, but it's re- but when you look at a way a buck moves through the landscape using his nose, first and foremost. If it's really great for you and it's really bad for him, there's a very good chance you're not going to see a mature buck there. So it's always about finding that mm. where it's really good for you and it's really good for him, but it's it's 99% good for him, but that 1% is where Bingo. you get to kill him. Yeah, he great thinks, he's, he thinks yeah. he's wind checking and he's yes. wind checking right into an arrow. Yeah, that's a, exactly. it's a great way to, great way to yeah. set it. And, and so then, setting this up, you, know, like you can see, like I want to point out for people that are looking at this, all the red globs are bedding cuts where we've mm-hmm. cut very aggressively. We've created very dense cover. We've created areas that we can know where deer are bedding. And then you see the white, and that's a TSI area. So it's, it's, we're looking at east, mainly north, and, and uh, a little bit of west and a lot of east slope there. So it's additional bedding, but it's not the dense cover that we're looking for in the, in the red. So we're basically bringing the deer very closely to the, to the location. So early in the season, we're bringing them very close so they don't have very far to go when, when they stand up to yep. come to the food source. And, you know, that time of the year, we're looking at greens being a, standing beans aren't as attractive. Yep. Right, yep. And so we're trying to lure them into very palatable, very green forage, shortening that distance from bedding to, to the location of the blind. And you've got great access. And which, it's just which is funny. Kind of mine. Typically, that's the scenario, right? Where, yeah, early season, it's not the beans and it's the greens. But but the year that you harvested last year, we were in such a bad drought up here. The greens weren't performing, but you had both, and they were hitting the beans. Yep. So, like, having multiple food sources and being right there on that pinch brings everything into range. But you, you don't put all your eggs in the basket of greens. You've yeah. got both right there. Yeah. But I think we also should touch bases. When you have bedding this close, which is what we all want to have because it increases daylight activity, yes. yeah. it, it also exposes your exit and entry. Mm-hmm. If you don't have a really solid plan to get in and out and you're putting your, your plan like we have here so close, you will become your worst enemy if you oh, don't yeah. have a good strategy. Yeah, you can see that also the terrain helps. You can mm-hmm. see it starts to break yep. over right at the edge of that field, so yep. you're not being silhouetted on the top of the field. That's another yep. big problem I see people making. Yep. Yeah, yep. I mean, the way the bedding thickets are established as well are the same as the food sources, and they lend themselves to the pinch. Yes. Bedding here, bedding here, pinch in between, so that the deer are comfortable making that travel route they've done it before they're going to continue to do it it's just another day in the woods for them and we just happen to be on the downwind side of that yeah exactly yeah to me it's you know i use this analogy a lot is do you remember the show home improvement and there was the guy wilson on that show and you never got to see him from the nose down he was always peeking over the fence and for you guys you're walking up peeking over the fence you're not fully exposed like you're not seeing his whole face in that show and you're not walking in and and walking across the, the food plot or walking across the field and being fully exposed. That's a, anytime you're doing that type of approach, walking across food plots, walking across crop fields, and you're exposing yourself, you're decreasing your chance of seeing a mature buck during daylight. And you take that pinch that could be superb, yeah. and you're just like, tank. Yeah. Yeah. The biggest thing is do your homework, assess it, evaluate, then don't be afraid to make the change Bingo. and make the change knowing that you can always go back. Yeah. That really sums it up. Well, we just finished a breakdown of this hunt, but head on over to this link to see it all go down.